to everybody. Um, welcome to the continuation of our Sustainable Energy Pathways uh, workshop. Uh, I appreciate you being here this afternoon. Um, this is going to be a continuation of the uh, initial four lectures that were given at Case Western Reserve University at the end of May. And the format I would like to, to keep the same, that is open discussion, interactive. So if there's any questions or comments as I go, please feel free to uh, interrupt me at any time. Before I get into the material, there's a couple things I, I would like to point out. Um, number one, uh, because I'm from Rochester Institute of Technology in New York, a lot of the um, analyses I'll discuss today and research topics are focused on New York State and we've used New York State data, but the methodologies are, are broadly applicable both within the U.S. and, and outside the U.S. Um, and secondly, this, these two lectures are going to be quite different than most of the other lectures you've he heard at uh, ACS because I'm not focusing on a specific technical area and doing a really deep analysis. The intention here is to give you a broad overview of um, some of the technology developments in two areas. The first is in biomass waste energy where we have a fairly significant uh, research program going at RIT. And the last um, lecture will address integrated energy, um, sustainable energy systems. So they're all inter interconnected, but I think will be a good complement to what was presented back in May. So with that, we'll get started. Just to um, briefly review what was done back in May, the first four lectures covered current energy infrastructure and the incumbent technologies. Then we touched on solar, wind, and electrochemical technologies. So for lectures two, three, and four, we had uh, experts from CASE in each of those technology areas sharing the lectures with me. I'd like to just highlight a couple of the main points that were raised in the initial lectures. And again, I want to stress that this, much of this it has a sustainability angle. So although the intention is towards sustainable technology development, we're talking about concepts here that may be new to some of the people in the audience. And so these are some of the things that we cover in, in courses we teach in our sustainability PhD program. The first uh, concept is the tragedy of the commons. So this, is, this relates to over-exploitation of common resources being a rational outcome when the benefits are realized by a few individuals, but the costs are borne by all. Okay? One obvious example of this is greenhouse gas emissions, where a fraction of Earth's population is benefiting from use of fossil fuels, but the costs of increased uh, atmospheric carbon is being borne by, by everyone. So we talked at length in, in back in May about this co uh, topic. Why are fossil fuels so difficult to displace? And the main reason is energy density. There just simply isn't anything else out there that has anything close to the energy density of petroleum fuels. And as an example of this, we talked about how a single human being working very hard on an exercise machine might be able to produce 100 watts continuously for 10 hours a day. And that's if you're in very good shape. So if you translate that into the equivalent amount of coal that you would need, it's only 4 tenths of a kilogram. So a pretty small amount of coal needed to replace the, the effort, the physical effort of a single human being. You can extend that to a horse, again working for 10 hours a day, that's still only about 2.7 kilograms of anthracite coal converted at 30% efficiency. So when you look at fossil fuels from that standpoint, you can understand why it's so hard to replace those things. The other um, important aspect of this is the poor efficiency of our current 
thermal conversion processes. And this is an example of an internal combustion engine on a vehicle where you start out with 100% of the energy content of that fuel. And then when you account for all the losses, you end up with somewhere in the neighborhood of 12%, 12.6% in this example, actually being delivered to the wheels on the road. And the situation is actually quite worse than that when you consider the fact that the purpose of the vehicle is, uh, the purpose of this, this combustion system is not to move the vehicle, it's to move the human being down the road. So if you scale that efficiency by the weight of me inside my v Chevy Malibu, you see that less than 1% of the energy content that you're putting into the vehicle is actually used to move the user of the vehicle down the road. So that's a pretty sobering dialogue on our current energy infrastructure. So everybody in this room is interested in technology. That's what excites us, that's what we're here for. But when we look at this from a, the standpoint of sustainability, we realize that technology is only one part of it and it certainly cannot do it all. In our courses, we often rely on this simple equation, which is called in some, in some circles the master equation. This is, simply says that environmental impact is some function of three things, population, affluence, and technology. So what we normally work on is this part, because that's the fun part. The harder things to deal with are global population control, and there's all kinds of sociological issues that come into that, but also affluence, which is really the amount of energy or resources each one of us uses. So the point is that we have to address all of those things in parallel. The other thing we talked about, and this really uh, generated a lot of interesting discussion back in May, is that economic and social considerations often counteract environmental considerations. We're, many of you in the room are working on wind and solar technology. Of course, on balance, those are better than burning fossil fuels. But to implement those things also has a big uh, social aspect. Like in this case here in West Virginia, where people that make their living off of coal mining may not see the environmental benefit of displacing coal the same way as those of us in the room would. So this is a question that I posed uh, in the earlier lectures and I'll pose it again. Why is renewable energy not equivalent to sustainable energy? Why aren't those the same? Buddy? And? <laughs> right. Yeah, so sustainable energy, when we talk about sustainable energy or sustainable technologies, there's really three considerations. Of course, we always think about the environmental part of it, and of course, a wind turbine is better than burning gasoline any day of the week. But there's also economics and social aspects that come into play. A lot of times we forget about economics, and indeed, an advanced energy technology cannot be truly sustainable unless it has a viable path to cost competitiveness with the incumbent. Otherwise, we're just wasting our time, right? It might reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 90%, but if it can never be cost competitive, it'll never get into the marketplace. So this is something that we need to comprehend early in the development process. And then the other point I wanted to remind everybody about is that when we talk about sustainable energy pathways, we have to put things into the system context. Again, another technology that's getting a lot of attention these days is electric vehicles. 
And at the point of use, there's no question that an electric vehicle has fewer greenhouse gas emissions than a gasoline vehicle. But one has to consider where the electrons are coming from. If the electrons are coming from coal-fired power plants in Indiana or West Virginia, that electric vehicle may have, actually have a higher greenhouse gas impact than a uh, gasoline internal combustion vehicle. So for sustainable energy pathways, we have to think about not only environment, but economic and social impacts as well. To deliver sustainable technologies, engineers and scientists need to think at the system level. And to deliver sustainable energy technology, you have to understand the incumbent. What are you trying to do better than? So if we just take a step back and talk about primary energy, that's naturally occurring energy, which has not been subjected to conversion. So we have non-renewables and renewables. And the non-renewables, we all know, coal, natural gas, crude oil, and uranium. And the renewables are solar, wind, biomass, moving water, and geothermal. So each of those has to go through a conversion process to be useful to us. And ultimately, what we get out of those things is mechanical work, electricity, heat, or some type of synthetic fuel, diesel, hydrogen, gasoline, whatever the case may be. So previously, we talked about solar and wind. And today, we're going to talk about biomass. So biomass is, is fundamentally different in this sense. Solar and wind are really technologies that can ultimately displace grid electricity. Right? So hopefully these nice technologies are going to get rid of these coal-fired power plants. Biomass typically is focused on displacing transportation fuel. Okay, so the context is a little bit different than what we're going to talk about today. As I mentioned, and most of you in the room, or those of you that were at Case in May know, I, I previously worked at General Motors uh, prior to um, moving over to RIT. And so I spent a lot of time looking at advanced vehicle technologies. All of the major automakers have a plot like this, where they're looking at how are vehicle technologies going to evolve over time and vary depending on um, uh, driving distance and size of the vehicle. So all, all major companies have this kind of matrix where over time we're going to see a predominantly petroleum-based mobility portfolio evolve into a combination of technologies. So we'll certainly have battery electric vehicles and hydrogen vehicles, but hybrid electric vehicles involving alternative fuels like ethanol, biodiesel, CNG, and so forth, will still be part of the mix. So even in the long term, where we, we expect to see broad deployment of electric vehicles and fuel cell vehicles, we could expect biofuels to be, be part of the, the picture. What drives the use of biofuels in the US is a so-called renewable fuel standard. So this is an EPA um, standard. It's not a mandate. It's, it's more of a, of a target. It's called a standard, but it's more of a target. There's no, there's no law that says we have to meet this, meet this goal. It's a standard, and it's something that the government and corporations are working toward. So it basically sets targets for integration of biofuels into the US transportation portfolio. And this is kind of a busy plot, but I just wanted to show you how this is structured. So as a, as a function of time, from 2008 to 2022, we're going to eventually get, way down here in the lower right-hand corner, to 36 billion gallons of biofuel. Now that's going to be a combination of conventional um, ethanol, corn, and this essentially is corn-based ethanol, which the EPA officially says 
results in a 20% reduction in life cycle greenhouse gas emissions. That's the official EPA position. Then all these uh, columns going to the right are so-called advanced biofuels. You have biomass-based diesel, which officially has to meet a 50% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Then non-cellulosic advanced, cellulosic biofuel, which is a 60% reduction. So by 2022, at least as of 2010, our target is 36 billion gallons of transportation fuel. So how big a number is that? We should understand what um, that number in the context of the total fuel demand in the US. So in 2022, the projected demand in the US uh, in terms of barrels of, of oil is 20, or 19 million barrels of oil per day. So that's actually a little bit less than we use right now. So from a single barrel of, of uh, oil, we typically get about 13 gallons, or rather 31 gallons of transportation fuel. 19 gallons of gasoline and 12 of diesel. So our daily fuel demand works out to 589 million gallons per day with an annual total fuel demand of 215 billion. So that's a big number. So this 36 billion gallon target is still less than one-fifth of the total amount of transportation fuel that's expected to be used in 2022. Okay, so this definitely is a um, significant number, but still uh, nowhere near the total amount of fuel that we use. So most of the biofuels that have been produced to date are uh, based on dedicated energy crops. And this is where there's been a lot of controversy around this subject, mostly because of corn ethanol. So there's two significant barriers to crop-based fuels. Some of the biofuels provide only marginal improvements in life cycle greenhouse gas emissions versus petroleum fuels. And there's been a lot of work done in that, in that area. And the second point is that even if you had significant reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, we're going to need very large land areas to produce all those crops. So that's what we wanted to just get our, our arms around here today and understand the magnitude of those two points. But before we do that, let's look at ethanol because this is really where the focus has been to date and biofuels. So for ethanol, we're forming from fermentation of sugars. Um, and those sugars were created by photosynthesis, of course. So you have your photosynthesis reaction to create glucose, fermenting glucose to ethanol, and then finally combusting your ethanol to produce heat, which provides the energy for the final application. But if you look at those reactions and cross out CO2 on either side, cross out water, glucose, oxygen, and then ethanol, you find that the overall reaction is simply light goes to heat. Okay, So biofuels are fundamentally solar energy, right? as is everything, I guess. At the end of the day, everything's solar energy, but light to heat. So the overall ethanol well-to-wheel cycle can, in principle, be carbon neutral but you have to account for all the energy that goes in along each step of the process. Okay, and so that's what we're gonna take a look at. Now, um, conventional corn-based ethanol. Let's talk about that because that's been, again, the subject of most of our biofuel activity in the US. Some of the problems are that only the corn kernel is used and not the entire plant. The corn starch first has to be converted using enzymes, and that reduces the net energy content and increases the greenhouse gas emissions while increasing the cost per gallon. 
And then there's also significant interference with the food supply and land use for food crops. But if we look at this from a sustainability standpoint, you have to ask, is it really that bad? It has some advantages. For example, from an economic standpoint, the cost is comparable with, with gasoline and it provides significant rural investment where investment is, is often lacking. From an environmental standpoint, most of the literature now s says that the, the benefit is around 20% in greenhouse gas emissions. Okay? Again, an area of, of uh, controversy, but this is the official EPA stance on corn-based ethanol. And lastly, something that we shouldn't for forget about is that it does provide a me measure of energy security. It's a domestically produced fuel which displaces fuel that's typically transported from, from overseas. So there are benefits, even though the, um, the downsides of it are still significant. So this is a, a plot from Michael Wang, who's at Argonne National Lab, and he's done a lot of analysis on biofuels. And he's just showing as a function of time, starting back in 1978 to 2007, all the published work on uh, the net energy value of corn-based ethanol. And although there's a fair number of people that claim it's actually uh, net energy negative, overall the consensus now is that there is some energy benefit to corn-based ethanol, albeit fairly small. Okay. There's also been other studies at Argonne National Lab, this one by, um, by, by Brinkman, um, and this was actually w including a group at General Motors, where they looked at the life cycle greenhouse gas emissions for a wide range of fuel and vehicle combinations. And so th this plot is showing for all these different vehicle fuel combinations, the tank to wheel, um, greenhouse gas emissions, as well as the well to tank. So this is basically saying, okay, the blue part of it has to do with fuel production or extraction. The yellow part is actual emissions at the point of use. So you'll see that some of these on the right-hand side that involve um, cellulosic ethanol with fuel cells can actually, in principle, achieve net carbon neutrality. So this is really what motivates us. How can we develop combinations of biofuels and vehicle propulsion technologies that can get us to these kinds of levels? Aside from greenhouse gas emissions, an another very important parameter that we often use to evaluate these systems is energy return on investment. So that's simply the energy return from actually operating that system or combusting that fuel or converting that fuel divided by the energy needed to extract the fuel, build a plant, develop the infrastructure, and all that. So obviously, uh, the higher the EROI, the better. Okay? So if you look at this plot, and this was published in 2010 by uh, Professor Murphy, um, the, this shows EROI for a number of different technologies. And you can see that historic gas and oil fields had energy return on investment of 50 or higher. They say that when oil was first discovered in Saudi Arabia, it was so close to the surface that it took almost no energy at all to extract it. So these EROI numbers were a thousand or some ridiculously high value because it took so little energy to extract it that it was almost free. Now we're dealing with technologies that are, aren't as, simply aren't as good. Wind and solar can still achieve these pretty high um, values, but as they call the net energy cliff, you start to get into you know, tar sands and temperate latitude biofuels, and those EROIs drop off a lot. So when you get down to this end, you're basically saying, 
hey, you're, you're, you're only getting a little bit more energy out of the fuel over what you're putting into it. So at some point, these numbers get so low that it, it, it isn't even worth the trip. And so this is some more data from the same study, just in tabular form. But for the people in this room, you'll be pleased to know that your EROI for wind turbines is 18, photovoltaic 6.8. And, and those are probably low numbers. The newer technologies are getting higher than that. So certainly wind and photovoltaic achieve high enough values in energy return on investment that they're certainly viable long term. The question is, can biomass ethanol corn, from sugar cane, corn-based ethanol, and biodiesel, can those ever become viable? Yep. So for hydropower, the ER, EROI is really, really high. Yep. Um, but isn't there, I mean, isn't hydropower kind of bad in that it disrupts ecosystems from a point of view of rivers? And a absolutely. I mean, this is only, th Th this is one of a number of different terms that you have to consider when asking the question, is it sustainable? This only looks at the energy aspect of it. For hydropower, no question about it. Once you inve invest the capital to build the plant, it's basically free at very large scale for an, a, a large number of years. That's why this number is so high. But it doesn't address the environmental and social aspects. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, uh, sugar cane ethanol. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that, um, from what I know and I read, uh, Brazil yep. is doing quite a large production of ethanol based yep. on sugar cane. Yep. But that comes at the depletion of the sugar cane from the Amazon, uh, Amazon River and our Amazon right. Bay, so to speak. And that has very important negative consequences right. on the health ecosystem. Absolutely. Now, we are protecting the environment by doing the ethanol from sugarcane while we are destroying the ecosystem in the Amazon region. Right. So right. I guess that's not something that is taken into consideration either. Right. Yeah, so I think that the, these numbers really relate to the economics of the system. So I think. Yeah, Brazil, I believe almost their entire fuel infrastructure is built around sugarcane ethanol right. now, right? And, and right. It's a very serious problem in terms of how that is changing, all this depletion of the sugar right. cane is uh, changing the ecosystem. Right. So, that, and that points to the need to comprehend those kinds of things in the development of these systems, right? So let's, let's take a look. The other aspect of this that I mentioned is land use. Okay, so even if we can get to the point where we say, okay, biofuels can be made so that you have a reasonably high energy return on investment and you can lower the greenhouse gas impact, what about the land use issue? So let's try to get a sense of how much land area we're talking about here. So this is from a paper published in 2010 in Chemical Engineering Progress where they were looking at yields for popular uh, non-corn-based biomass. So you have poplar, red maple, corn stover. That's basically the corn plant minus the, the actual corn kernel. And then switchgrass, which we've heard a lot about. If you look at the maximum yields computed for each of those, you have a range of uh, 95 to 111 gallons per ton. So in rough terms, 100 gallons per ton is a, is, a, is a good average number to work with. So if you look at switchgrass, this has been, there's a lot of interest in switchgrass because it's a native plant that thrives in a, in a wide range of climates and it requires very little water or fertilizer. Okay, so the USDA yield range for switchgrass is 330 to 810 gallons per acre. So if we were going to satisfy the 2022 renewable fuel standard goal of 21 billion gallons of advanced biofuel, that's on top of the 
15 billion gallons of corn ethanol, that would require 60 million acres. So that's roughly the area of Colorado and a significant fraction of the 400 million acres of land that are uh, currently used for farming in the U.S. Yeah? How does foot grass compare to regular, like, grass in the lawn? What's the difference in the flavor of the Don't know that off, off, offhand. I do know that the switchgrass is a very rapidly growing plant that grows very high, so they can harvest it multiple times in a growing season. I think that's part of the reason that you get these big yields, but I don't know. I know there's a lot of interest in cellulose and stuff in this group. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I think there's biomass there, but to me, I think it's a matter of scale, right? Yeah, in principle, you could use those materials for fuel or, you know, for not only for transportation, but for fuel in general. But you need such a huge amount of it, right? If you think about for one ton only gets you 100 gallons of material. All the grass you mow at RPI is, you know, maybe a couple of tons a year, right? Maybe. But no, it's, so there's been um, a number of studies conducted on this question. What is the upper limit on ethanol production, right? We, we know where we are now, we know what we need to get for to satisfy the renewable fuel standard, but what's the upper limit? So there's been a number of studies here that range from 45 billion gallons per year to 140 billion gallons per year. So let's look at this center study that was conducted by Sandia National Lab and General Motors. They state that 90 billion gallons per year can be produced, but with enduring government commitment that can probably be translated into incentives and continued technological pro progress, okay? But let's look at what that really means in terms of land area. This group, uh, led by Schmur in 2008, actually did a study with switchgrass and this was on-farm measurements. So they had, I believe, 10 acres of land in different parts of the country and directly measured yields and came up with this average number of 2,500 liters per hectare. So by their calculation, even if we could produce 90 billion gallons per year, it would take the area of five Colorados to do that. Okay, so are these things possible? Yes, they are, they're technically possible. But obviously, when you start talking about this amount of land area, there's important social and environmental questions that come into play. To your point, what you have to think about here is just the sheer scale of this stuff. This is a plant in Iowa that's producing over 100 million gallons of, eth of ethanol a year. This is how they have to move the corn grains into the, into the reactor. They actually have these elevators that can tip up a whole tractor trailer because it has to be that efficient in order to do this at that scale, 100 million gallons per year. Okay, so if, again, if, and this is only 100 million gallons. The renewable fuel standard talks in terms of tens of billions of gallons. So this is the scale that you have to do things at if you're going to meaningfully displace petroleum-based fuels that have these very high energy densities. So why is the energy return on investment for biomass so poor? The main reason is that so many resources go into growing the crops, right? So the question is, could waste-based biomass be better? Waste basically means it's there, it's available. You don't have to spend the money or resources to grow them. 
And you guys, I'm sure, are familiar with these maps from NREL. There's maps just like this for solar and wind capacities. This is for biomass. So this is all the biomass uh, plotted by county in thousands of tons per year. Uh, and this includes things like crop residue, forest residue, methane that comes from uh, wastewater treatment plants and landfills. Uh, all those kinds of things. So these are really uh, waste biomass resources that are available. So as you'd expect, a lot are concentrated in the Midwest, but also along the West Coast where we are now is a pretty um, heavy agricultural region. There's a lot of these kinds of materials around. So how would you define waste? We're interested in using waste from a sustainability standpoint, but how would you define that? Waste. Something you don't want. So does that imply that there's, you don't want, so that implies it has no value, right? No, it doesn't imply that it has value. It's something that I don't want. That you personally don't want. It could be someone else wants okay, it. Some, okay, maybe somebody else wants it. Right, so is any material that's a good point, because is any, so it, it, it invokes another question. Is any material truly waste? Is anything truly with, without material value? When I ask this question to the class I teach at RIT, the only, the only material that students came up with was nuclear waste, and that may, may If you have breeder reactors, right. Make weapons. <laughs> Make weapons. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. Can he be part of this estate? Can he be part of this pyre if he's talking about weapons? Uh, no. No. Yeah. So the point. Right. 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 But I think, ba based on what you said, though, because you said in nature that's the way it's done, right? right? Yeah. So probably what it means is that human beings just aren't handling these things properly. We should handle our industrial systems more like na they, nature does, right? And that's the, that's the whole point of your project, right? Is exactly that, right? So we'll, in the next lecture, we'll talk about industrial symbiosis, which is essentially that, that you want industrial systems to mimic natural systems, where inputs and outputs are always exchanged and nothing is wasted, okay? So the point here is that really nothing, there is no material that can't be used in another process. And this is certainly true of biomass waste. So on that basis, you look at our current system, certainly in the U.S., but this is a problem globally, and it's pretty absurd, right? When you look at landfills and wastewater treatment plants, we're using huge amounts of fossil fuels to render biological materials, quote unquote, harmless. It's really an absurd situation. So waste energy strategies utilize organic feedstocks from existing commercial systems, put them to productive use, okay? So we've been doing research in this area for a number of years, and at RIT, we, we interact with a lot of small companies. So uh, whereas a lot of university research groups are focused on fundamental materials, we really w focus more on system level things and interact with a lot of small and medium sized companies. So one of the, one of the uh, studies we did several years ago was looking at the waste materials available in Monroe County where Rochester is, and we were specifically interested in the materials that go to the wastewater treatment plant. So in Monroe County, which has a, roughly a million people, 
there's one central wastewater treatment plant where all, all the materials go to. Companies that are big producers of, the, of uh, uh, high strength waste have to pay a surcharge. So all that, all that information is in the public domain. So we sent out freedom of information law requests and we're able to get this kind of data and uh, including the company names, which I didn't include here, but just to look at what kinds of companies were sending waste to the wastewater treatment plant and paying these big surcharges. And it turns out that seven of the 10 largest surcharges were paid by food processing companies or food related companies. So that's when we first started looking at this as a real opportunity um, to start to assess the potential for waste energy technologies. So that waste surcharge is based upon this surcharge factor, which includes um, terms uh, based on biological oxygen demand, suspended solids, chlorine, and phosphorus. And these, these uh, factors, A through D, are updated on an annual basis. So over time, based on their operating and, ma and maintenance cost, they can adjust the surcharge. So waste to energy, as we define it, is converting byproducts of a manufacturing operation into usable energy. And the key point here is that there's dual economic benefits. Because while you're eliminating the waste disposal cost, you can also generate energy that can be used to offset plant demand. So you can think of this as a two-step process. First, waste of fuel. So taking your waste material and producing some kind of hydrocarbon fuel, either by fermentation, which produces an alcohol, typically ethanol or butanol, biodiesel, which can be a direct replacement for petroleum diesel, or through an anaerobic digestion process, produce a biogas that's comprised of as much as 60% methane. Once you have your fuel, then the second part of the process is the actual conversion to the usable energy source. So this might include combustion in a boiler. So at a food processing plant, there's typically a high steam demand. So it's lots of steam boilers. Electricity production versus via some kind of combustion process, like a, a reciprocating engine. Electricity production by a fuel cell. Or lastly, cleanup and compression for natural gas vehicles. And this is the way we've kind of structured our um, research program. So we, we have students working on organic biomass characterization and management. Then there's really four different conversion processes to fuel. One is direct electrochemical conversion through a microbial fuel cell. The second category is chemical and biochemical conversion. So this includes anaerobic digestion, fermentation or transesterification to biodiesel. Thermochemical conversion is gasification and pyrolysis. So once you have those biofuels through these processes, they can be directly combusted or they can be further upgraded to hydrogen and then used in a number of different fuel cell technologies. So as I alluded to earlier, the key here is to look at this overall flow map and understand where we have opportunities to drive this to carbon neutrality. In principle, starting with organic biomass, you can get to a fuel cell system, including combined heat and power, and achieve very high efficiencies with very low life cycle greenhouse gas emissions. So these are some of the specific areas we've worked in. Anaerobic digestion of food processing waste. Biodiesel from waste grease and oil. So I'll get into more of the details on these two areas. But then also biodiesel from algal lipid oil. And we also have a, a um, close relationship with, with the landfills in Monroe County. 
Doesn't sound that exciting, but it's actually pretty interesting to work at a landfill. Yeah. Um, have you ever thought about doing this sort of thing for like a chemical process? Not necessarily tools, but like platform chemicals? Yeah, so there's a, I'm sure you're aware there's a lot of work now in bio bioplastics and all that. And there's actually, um, you know, if you t think in terms of, of value per ton, of raw biomass, bioplastics are definitely the, 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 w the way to go. That's where the greatest economic value is, is achievable. The problem right now is that the, the demand isn't there yet for a lot of those. I think over time you'll start to see a lot more of these biomass materials going toward bioplastics. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, that's become a big part of this process because the bi the main byproduct from transesterification is glycerol. So there's a and now the the uh, the the commodity price on glycerin is is the lowest it's been in a hundred years because of that. And so there's a lot of interest in that. I'm not familiar with that specific one. Um, we do have students that are working in that. It's not in, in my group, but there are other groups at RIT that are, that are looking at um, those materials as, as precursors for chemical, chemical processes. Yeah, and I think you'll see more of that. Our focus is really more on the energy side, but that's a good, that's a good point. So I, I was saying we've, we also have a lot of interaction with our local landfills, and, and it's Sounds sort of funny to say, hey, we're working in a landfill, but there's a huge source of methane gas, and there's a lot of interesting things you can do with that gas, which I'll, I'll talk about um, in the next um, presentation. So first of all, anaerobic digestion. So if you just take biomass and throw it out in the farm field, which is usually what's done with it, that... Um, that uh, biomass is accessible by, by oxygen, so it usually goes through an aerobic digestion process, which basically produces a lot of CO2 and a lot of water. Okay? In anaerobic digestion, we're precluding oxygen. So you're, you're, if you look at it, kind of your model compound is glucose, that's going to go to a lower amount of CO2, but you're also going to make a lot of methane. So in that sense, taking biomass and processing it in the absence of oxygen can be um, quite useful. So south of southwest of Rochester, about 40 miles, is a town called Covington. And in that town, there's the Synergy Biogas plant. So it's hard to get the scale from, from this picture, but this main reactor vessel here is enormous, okay? And that's 1.4 megawatt capacity, which really is not that big in terms of the size of a power plant and how much a typical power plant will produce. This is probably 500 to 1,000 times less than what, say, a coal-fired power plant would produce, okay? So, um, what, but the point here is that this is a, a co-digestion system. So we're combining manure and food waste. This is on a dairy farm with 2,000 cows. So there's ample supply of manure, and to that we're adding food waste. The location of that plant is right here, and all these red dots show where we're transporting food waste from. So you can see that to even to achieve 1.4 megawatts, which is a large amount of power, but in the grand scheme of things, it's a pretty small amount of power. You need to transport a lot of food waste from um, long distances. So we are interested to know, hey, how does that impact the environmental performance of this system? So we. To do that, to really understand that, we need to, to understand the performance of this anaerobic co-digestion system relative to the incumbent. So in the incumbent case, you're taking dairy manure, you're storing it, and then you're basically just spreading it on the fields. 
That's typically what's done with dairy manure. For organic food waste, you're gonna, you have some hauling operation, and then it ends up, again, being field spread or going to a landfill. Wastewater treatment plant are being used for animal feed. That's the conventional system. The anaerobic co-digestion case, we're actually combining those into the, into the digester. It's producing methane gas, which then goes into a, a gen set to produce electrical power. So we did a full life cycle assessment comparing these things, and these are the findings. We achieve a 92% reduction in greenhouse gas impact relative to the base case. Most of the benefit comes from displacing grid electricity. So New York, western New York, has a relatively clean electrical grid. If you did this in an area with a dirty grid, the impact would be even greater. Because that methane that's used to produce electricity is displacing grid, the grid electricity. The emissions associated with transporting food waste, it turns out, are small relative to the avoided emissions from not sending it to a landfill. So this study shows that you can transport food from fairly long distances and not affect the overall greenhouse gas benefit. That system can be further improved by covering the digestate lagoon to eliminate fugitive uh, methane. So at the end of the process, all this goo still ends up in these big lagoons where it sits for a while before it's field spread. If you covered those, you would Im further improve the performance, eliminate food leaks and non-flared releases, and then lastly, increasing the food waste fraction. So these are some of the um, food processing plants in New York State. Um, major plants that are indicated by these red triangles. I just wanted to show you a study that we did up here in the North Country by the Canadian border. And this is at a cottage, cottage and cream cheese plant. And this is a typical plant you're going to see that, that um, does food processing. You have your big plant here, and basically what they do, and this is in a very rural region, so there's not a lot of um, people living in close proximity, they basically pipe all that waste way back here to this aerobic treatment plant that they have on site. So this plant is a major supplier of cheese products to um, groceries in New York State, but it's part of a larger corporation and they're under pressure to reduce their energy use and improve their greenhouse gas profile. So that's why they came to talk to us about this. And so we went there, and in the back, looking back in the, these aerobic basins, you can see the apartment complex in the back, the high, high rent district over there. Um, but you have these aeration basins that use these large compressors for aeration and circulation, and they were actually using 12 million kilowatt hours per year at $750,000. So we recommended conversion to an anaerobic system to significantly reduce the electricity demand, the disposal cost, and to produce a usable biogas. So the specifics of that recommendation were Phase one, to install oxygen sensors with feedback control on the compressors, because you only want to maintain an oxygen content of about 7%. And this would enable them to lower the energy use in their compressors. And then the long-term solution would be to cover those basins to convert them to anaerobic, essentially anaerobic digesters at a cost of $450,000 per year which would give them a two-year, less than two-year payback time. So this is another example of a, of a facility that has a lot of organic waste that, if it's treated properly, can not only significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but can have very significant economic value.
So to close out um, this first session, I just wanted to uh, talk about biodiesel because this is another area of research at RIT. So biodiesel typically now is produced from soybeans. So a dedicated energy crop. Long term, there's a, there's a lot of interest in algae as, as a um, biodiesel feedstock because the yields for algae far exceed the yields that can be achieved with land-based crops. What we're focusing on is the use of waste cooking oil as a feedstock for biodiesel. You say waste cooking oil, how, how much waste cooking oil can there be? There's actually a lot of waste cooking oil, <laughs> surprising amount of cooking oil that's used in the U.S. So from a, a study done by NREL, they actually went and uh, did a survey that covered all, every state in the U.S. and came up with this average um, amount of oil per person in the U.S., 23 pounds of oil used for cooking. And if you go through the math, that translates into a potential of 975 million gallons of biodiesel per year. If you're assuming that 7.5 7 pounds of oil go into one gallon of um, biodiesel. So yeah, that's a very large number. Still a small fraction of the 30 billion gallons of biodiesel used. But it's significant enough that it makes you think this is something that we, sh we can and should be taking a look at. So we had a project funded by the Environmental Protection Agency on exactly this, to develop this kind of, of uh, process in a closed system like a university. So at RIT we have roughly 18,000 students and 3,800 faculty. There's 18 uh, on-campus eateries with six having major frying facilities, and we generate 5,400 gallons of waste cooking oil annually. And this is what the consum oil consumption looks like. It's, as you'd expect, it's low in the summer and then peaks when the freshmen come to school and they're eating a lot of french fries and stuff because they miss home. And then it drops down, jumps back up after the start of spring semester and then tails off again at the end. So we developed this process in our lab using this springboard biodiesel um, system. So we have a conical separation tank where we put the waste oil in, it basically separates by gravity. We take the water and solid particles off the bottom and then uh, put the, the usable oil into this unit and then it goes through this two-step reaction using methanol and potassium hydroxide. And from um, 50 gallons of oil plus 10 gallons of methanol, we get roughly 48 gallons of biodiesel and 12 gallons of glycerin. So as you mentioned earlier, glycerin is a major byproduct of this reaction. So there's a lot, if you're gonna make a lot of biodiesel, there's gonna be a lot of glycerin out there to, to think about. So we, we collect the oil from each of the um, fryer facilities. And then we, as I said, separate the uh, virgin oil before the transesterification reaction. And then we actually blend it in our lab because the trucks on campus are all rated to operate up to B20. So you can't run a, a, warrant, a truck under warranty at above B20. So we have to blend it with road diesel in our lab into this fueling tank and then we can take it out to the back dock and actually fuel vehicles. So we, we ran these experiments. Yes? Sorry, uh, what alcohol are you using for the fresh uh, diesel? Methanol. And is there, is there a big difference between, not the methanol versus ethanol? I, people use ethanol, but the typical process, the more refined process, is using methanol with, e, with either potassium hydroxide or sodium hydroxide. 
Ethanol has been used. Correct. Right. Yeah, and as I'll talk about, in, you know. No, it is. It, yeah, it is. It is toxic, so it has to be. But and, and we absolutely, and we we um, we also want to recover the 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 um, methanol because if you look at um, if you look at the glycerin, the glycerin here really is. This is crude glycerin, so this has a significant amount of methanol, residual methanol in it, unreacted. So. What we're working on now is a purification process here because you want to recover the methanol and s recycle that into your process. Because the methanol actually is the most e expensive component in this whole process. So if we could um, either replace that or significantly uh, reduce the amount we have to use, that would improve the economics. So then we um, tested these vehicles on, on the campus. So we run on this l campus loop where near our building there's one hill and then it's pretty flat the rest of the way. Um, and we just monitor, we have a, uh, vehicle emissions equipment so we can monitor the emissions as we drive. So CO2, uh, CO, and then um, the uh, exhaust oxygen. So you can see that going over this initial hill, if you're going up the hill, you're going to increase your CO2 um, output in the exhaust. And then there's a speed bump at the top of the hill where you slow down and then accelerate again. And then you take your foot off the gas as you come down the hill. So you see kind of an inverse relationship between the CO2 and the oxygen. And um, you know, then we monitored the overall um, emissions. Because we're only running with B20, we can't run pure biodiesel. We don't get that, that large of an, of an improvement in, um, in CO2 emissions. But the economics look, look pretty good. Again, this is a fairly small volume operation in a constrained environment. So the question was always, hey, can we make this cheap enough? At this scale, can you make it cheap enough? And we believe we can. With, including wages, we're at about 335 a gallon, and that's still quite a bit lower than um, the most recent data we have nationally. And that the payback period in years really depends on how many gallons you're making a year you can get the payback time of the system down to about one year if you're making around 12,000 12, gallons per year. So the point is that um, on a small scale, you can do these kinds of things, convert biomass waste into usable energy, and it doesn't have to be necessarily at such a large scale. If you're starting with waste-based biomass, Certainly, you could never grow soybeans on a small field to make 5,000 gallons of biodiesel a year. But if you're working in a constrained system with waste materials available, it becomes viable. So the last part of this work was a full life cycle assessment on our um, constrained system. So we're considering waste cooking oil and each step in the process with all of the inputs Electri electricity and all the material inputs, and then calculating the emissions. By far the largest contributor to the overall emissions, which is 80.6 80, 80 kilograms of CO2 for 100 kilometers, is the actual combustion step. Because again, we're, we're, we're only running at 20% biodiesel, so most of the emissions in the overall process come from combusting the um, petroleum fuel. Another question that we wanted to answer is, what is the energy return on investment? Yes, sir. Yeah, so the, the oil that we use on campus is all soybean based. Okay, so we really only studied that. 
and they get it from a single vendor and it's all soybean oil. But there, there's been work uh, reported in the literature where, you know, if you're using like canola oil or palm oil, you get different performance. A big consideration is what's the cold, the, the cloud point, how, how low can you go in temperature before it starts to coagulate. And here, though, we really didn't consider that because it was all with just soy base and it was blended at B20. So we really didn't study variations, but it definitely matters what the raw feedstock is, whether it's palm oil, canola, soy, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, so um, now what's happened with waste cooking oil, because of the biodiesel um, industry, is that most of it is collected by renderers and it ultimately goes to biodiesel production. Previously, it was collected and basically put down the drain and would end up at the wastewater treatment plant. But now, at least in our area, most of it is collected, okay? So if it, didn't, if it wasn't produced into biodiesel on campus, it would likely ultimately go to a very large scale plant somewhere. Our interest in this was to figure out, can this still be economically and environmentally viable at small scale in a constrained system? That's what we are studying here. And this data in fact shows that if you look at energy return on investment, we calculated through our life cycle assessment a number of just over four. And in this table, you have reported values for waste cooking oil and then dedicated feedstock oils, and we're right in that same range. So that says that even at small scale, if you're starting with waste material, you can get an energy return on investment that's in the same range as what you would get at a very large scale plant, okay? <clears throat> okay, so to close out this section, um, waste energy economic and environmental viability can be achieved by effective utilization of all co-products. So you want to use everything that comes out of your process in some way. A symbiotic integra integration of subsystems, that is to say the output of one system becomes the input of another system. And we'll talk about that more in the next talk. Close proximity among waste supply production and the final demand centers. Okay, if you can eliminate transportation distances from supply to, de de to demand, it makes these systems look much more compelling. And then lastly, solid understanding and preferably control of long-term waste feedstock supply and the final biofuel or electricity demand. And some of the challenges in waste energy going forward, the cost relative to the incumbent. And this is a problem with any of these technologies is that mature technologies based on things like hydrofract natural gas are still very cheap. For aqueous waste streams, we need effective separation methods because we don't want to move water around. If you have aqueous waste that has a lot of bio, uh, bio mass in it, you want to separate it first because you don't want to be trucking water around at eight pounds a gallon. Fuel cell systems require further uh, development and cost reduction for biogas cleanup. So like from an anaerobic digester, you're going to produce biogas that might be 60% methane. For a fuel cell system, you want 100% methane. So we need those cleanup, further work in those cleanup systems. We're, we're starting to see a commodity market developing around organic waste. So the long-term economics of a centrally located waste energy plant is not clear. And then lastly, regulations and policy are constantly moving. For example, will there be a food waste disposal ban? Massachusetts just passed a food waste disposal ban. So in Massachusetts, commercial operations can no longer send food waste to landfills. They have to do something else with it, composting or anaerobic digestion or something. 
Will that happen in other areas? And other things like renewable energy credits affect this too, as it does in a lot of other industries. That is, a, is another policy question that seems to be a moving target. So in closing, um, we need to always keep in mind that technology can't do it all. Remember this equation, impact, environmental impact is dependent on population, affluence, and technology. And technology can only get us so far. And I'd like to close with this, with this message here. Again, from this paper that I referred to earlier in 2010, the U.S. currently throws out about one quarter of the food it produces. 20% of our national energy is used in food production. So we could save 5% of our total energy use by not wasting food. That number is 10 times more than all the energy currently produced by wind turbines and photovoltaics. Okay, so when you look at it in that sense, it's, it's eye-opening. So again, technology is great, and that's what we're interested in, that development has to occur, but affluence matters too. The way we handle materials, things like waste, and how we're using the resources have to be taken into consideration as well. So I think that's it for this um, talk. We'll take a, a, a 10 minute or so break. Any questions on this before we close out with integrated energy systems? Yeah. Yep. In the U.S. and how it changed when you talked about the incumbent technology, mm -hmm. and how it changed the uh, uh, the equity line. Or, you, know, you talk about grid equity uh, in photovoltaics, and it just took where the line was to reach equity and moved, moved it. it. Right. How, how much do you think that uh, has affected the uh, the receptivity to these kinds of Oh, it's, cer it's certainly affected it, no, no, no question about that. We're, we're seeing that. <clears throat> we just, in fact, just last week, we, we went and talked to some farmers in our area about the possibility of putting in an anaerobic dig digester to you know, handle their um, manure waste, and that's exactly the comment we got back. Why would we do that when natural gas is so cheap? I think it's definitely something that's going to affect, affect the industry, not, not only in biomass, but broadly. But again, it comes back to what is truly sustainable. Sustainability isn't only economics. We tend to think about economics first, and that's ultimately what's going to drive these things, but it's not the only part of the equation. How do we, how do we monetize carbon emissions? Now we don't. That's, we talked about the tragedy of the commons, and that's part of the problem, is that everybody's bearing the cost of CO2 emissions, but a few people are benefiting from it. So I think without some policy action, it's, it's going to be hard when we have, by conservative estimates, a 100-year supply of natural gas in the U.S. Yeah. You made the point that renewables are being sustainable. Right. Right. It's a really tough sell for people in spite of the environmental impact. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yes, yeah, Ika. Well, I think that another point which I really appreciate is that very much on how it opens to the issue of action. So, how do you define action? Is there a direct correlation between action and waste? I would think, I would think there is. Yeah. 
point is that if, if you actually consider the happening like um, with the worldwide America, like United States, is a very happening nation. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's it's imaginable that we have twenty percent of our food go to waste. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, in, in fact, to, to your point, on the plane coming here, I was reading a paper on, on food waste energy conversion, and it was written by a group in China. And much of the, in, of the research now is being done in China because, the, because of the population the food, and the gr growing affluence, the food waste produced in China now far exceeds the, the U.S. Yeah, so this is definitely a global problem, but I think it's strongly correlated to, to wealth, right? It's strongly correlated. Hydrogen fuel will come under renewable or non-renewable? Hydrogen? Uh, well, right now it would be not renewable because it, almost all of it comes from steam methane reforming, right? Long term, and I showed some of that data from Argon. Long term, what we'd like to get to is uh, solar electrolysis. That would be the end game if we could use, uh, you know, photocatalysis to to break the water molecule. So yeah, it can be, but right now it's definitely not. And I think I mentioned I used to work at General Motors on the fuel cell vehicle program. That was really the that's the barrier. Because if you can't get renewable hydrogen, what's the point of a fuel cell vehicle? It re really doesn't make sense. Um, so yeah, long term, and you can get hydrogen from biomass. I didn't talk about that, but you can, you, you can do the fermentation reaction to produce hydrogen instead of me uh, uh, methane, of course. But um, right now, it's almost all made by reforming natural gas. Yeah. So yeah, I, I would not consider that to be a renewable pathway. It can, it, it's possible, but we're not there now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's 20, 20% now. Yeah. Yeah, but having worked in the automotive industry, I can tell you that a big uh, OEM is never going to invest in that unless it's the whole chicken and the egg, right? So it, it almost necessarily has to be a policy instrument that starts that, right? And I mean, you see, like in Europe in particular, they're much more advanced. Like all these things I'm talking about here, Europe is probably 20 years ahead. Like in anaerobic digestion, all the companies that are building these plants are European companies, mostly either from Germany or Denmark. Okay? And, but why did Europe do it? Because of, of policy, number one. And I think, secondly, um, it's, it's education. I think there's a better um, understanding, broadly, I mean, in the general public, not among scientists, but I think in the general public. And maybe it's because it's a smaller and they have fewer resources there. In the US, I think sometimes because it's such a big country with lots of natural resources, we lose sight of this stuff. So yeah, ultimately it's got to, there has to be policy instruments that kind of push it in that direction. And you start to see small things happening. For example, with biodiesel, now New York City just passed a 2% mandate on biodiesel in heating fuel. New York, New York still uses a lot of uh, oil for heating, not just natural gas. And New York City uses a lot of diesel. Now they have a 2% mandate. That's small, but it's a start, right? You start, you, even those small numbers like that can, then the producers look at that and say, okay, now I have a reason to invest in this. And then the costs come down. And then you start to see this happening. But without policy, as he said, um, with natural gas,
so plentiful, so cheap, um, it's hard to compete with without policies that, that influence it and come at it from the, the uh, um, CO2 emission standpoint. So any other comments, questions? So why don't we just break for five minutes and we can keep going. Thanks for your attention and patience. Thank you.